Welcome back. So good morning. It's all about Craven, and I am not Steve Tyson. So Steve opened up the show, and then uh, he asked me to step in, and we want to talk about something a little different today. So we're going to talk about some local uh, events that are happening, some resources in the community. But I wanted to talk about, spend some time talking about something that is my profession that I spent a lot of time dealing with, and that is addiction. Uh, addiction is something that affects so many people in our community. So in the United States alone, there's an estimated 30 million people that are struggling in active addiction or with active addiction. And when you look at the numbers of adults in America alone, that's about one in 10 people that's struggling with active addiction. But it's not just a, a situation that they face, it's not just a problem that they face, it's something that affects really everybody. Because if you think about it, that's one person, that, but it's not just affecting their life, it's affecting their friends, it's affecting their family, it's affecting their community, it's affecting their coworkers. Uh, it has such, it takes such a toll on the community as a whole. And a lot of the things that we've been doing to try to solve this problem or try to move beyond the struggles that are brought up or that people face with addiction, it just hasn't worked. For uh, uh, nearly 100 years now, we've been trying to deal with the consequences of and the reality that addiction brings into our society and into our community. And some of the things that we've been trying just haven't worked. So there's a, this is a conversation that we need to have. It's something that we need to have a better understanding of and see in some different ways so that we can really make a difference and not uh, so we can move beyond some of the, the pain, the suffering that's created because of this reality in our communities. Uh, I read the other day that there's an estimated $700 billion economic cost because of addiction and because of drug use or drug misuse in America. The $700 billion, that's not just the money that's spent fighting it and the money that's spent helping people who have suffered the consequences of their, their drug use, but economic costs, business-related economic costs, because people are missing work, they're not engaged, or they're dealing with things personally that, they, that affects the contributions they can make to the community or to their employers. So. Uh, that's, what, that's what the conversation is going to be about for the rest of this morning. And that we're going to talk about drugs and addiction and understanding from a place of compassion, from a place of hope, from a place of understanding and acceptance of the reality of the situation that we're in so that we can find better ways to move beyond it. And I've got some special guests that have come to join me for this conversation, uh, but that's what it's about. And if you can find us on Facebook Live, if there's any questions or anything that you'd like to address specifically, you can send us a message on Facebook Live or you can send me an email at my email address which is Garrett at GarrettBiss.com. Uh, before we go forward let me introduce this gentleman that's been sitting here to my left side. So Matt Knight please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your your history or your understanding of and how both professionally and personally uh, addiction has been something that's touched your life. It, uh, it has and it touches everybody's lives and that's that's one of the stigmas that is on addiction and uh, substance use and misuse is that uh, um, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to, we act like it's not there. We want to keep our head in the sand and act like it doesn't touch each and every one of us when it does. And sure. Um, I've been in law enforcement for almost 20 years now and I've, I've seen that side of, of how things are happening in the community and then also see the side of our, our friends and family members that have issues and with drugs and use and misuse. And it's been something that has, it, it takes a toll on you just seeing it so much, so prevalent, but it also wants, in, makes you want to be empowered to go and try to change things and try to do the best you can do. Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, it's it's staggering with the numbers, like you said, all the millions of people that it affects, but when you look at just last year, well, actually in 2018, there were 73,000 people that died uh, due to opioids. Right. Well, I mean, you have 58,000 people over a six, seven year period that died in Vietnam. Right. And so we are losing well 20 25 percent mm. more per year than we did in the entire conflict that was there yes and that's those are those numbers are staggering because those are real people those are those are those are our kids that's yeah. our families that's like a nine they say like a 9 11 every you know month or month and a half that's I mean, exactly that's the what number of people that have, that have died that's and, uh, yeah it's incredible um, and and the yeah and like you, you mentioned those are family members those are the the neighbors in our you know in our community and when it affects i mean it's such a drastic consequence that they face the ripple the rippling effects of the rest of the community i mean the it's really the whole community that's suffering. It is, and it's 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 very few people that to say, they get up and say, "Hey, I want to go do drugs today." Certainly, um, it's not that. It's the ones that uh, they slip on the mm -hmm. concrete outside of their right. home. Um, and that's, and that's a big thing. There's so many different reasons mm -hmm. that can take somebody to that place, and I think you know, and that's where a lot of the misunderstanding comes from. That 
creates the stigma, fuels the stigma, prevents people from getting the help that they need because we don't really, you know, for a, a lot of people don't really understand what addiction is. They, they look at drugs, we demonize drugs, we say that's, that's what's wrong, that's the bad thing, so we've created this war on drugs trying to get rid of drugs. But really the war on drugs is trying to get rid of uh, of a symptom of something that goes much deeper. So even if we eradicate drugs, the successful attempts that we've had to get drugs out mm -hmm. of a community or get a certain drug off the streets, the effects, the positive effects are so limited because people are still suffering inside and people will find some other way to avoid or escape or numb from their, from their problems. Uh, it's not the drug, you know, in many ways, the drug is the solution for somebody for a period of time because of the, the pain that they're going through, the situations that they've faced. As you mentioned, you know, the slip and fall, and they, you know, now they have a physical pain, which uh, compounds with uh, emotional pain if they're taken away from their profession. You know, they have a certain sense of meaning and purpose from the work that they do or the ways that they're engaged in the community. And if their accident or the situation that they're facing, the, you know, the, the physical consequence they're facing takes them away from that, that only compounds the emotional issue, which further fuels this need for the, the emotional escape and the emotional numbing. Yeah. And we find, I found too that uh, not just with injuries and uh, uh, things that happen with the community members is that Finding that mental health is, is one of the huge, huge reasons that people turn to things. They're self-diagnosing and they're self-prescribing and they're mm -hmm. self-taking um, when really uh, they're just trying to hide what, what depression or anxiety that they're having to go through. And it's, and it's okay. It's normal. We're all failed. We're all flawed. Mm -hmm. We're all broken. Um, and it, we just need to get it to the point where it's not something that we have to hide, that we, we have issues. Sure. That we need to sit down. We, sometimes we need to talk with somebody. Sometimes there is medications that can help people. Um, but I, I see quite a bit, too, that people are, are struggling with addiction um, are, are trying to mask the depression, anxiety, or the stress levels that they're, they're currently going through, right. and that's how they're dealing with it. And so um, that's, that's an unfortunate reality that mm -hmm. we have to look at, too. And I see so many people that are in situations and they're so resistant to getting help for many reasons. The stigma is a huge mm -hmm. thing. They don't want to admit to others and you know that they've had this struggle that they're going right. through because we're afraid of how people think of us and how people will judge us. But another thing is for so many people, by the time it gets out of control, that drug or that behavior becomes the way that they survive. It becomes, you know, it's their coping mechanism for everything in life. It replaces so many other things. And the thought of living a day without that ability to diffuse some of that pain or mask some of that pain is just too great of a, you know, you can't even get to that point where you can comprehend being able to live without it. It doesn't mean that they can't get there. And obviously there's a lot of wonderful services and resources that can help somebody get there. But making that the barrier, like, hey, we need you to give up your lifeline so that we can begin to work with you. A lot of people are so afraid of that because they can't comprehend giving that part of their life up or that that coping mechanism up because it very you know becomes a very real part of their survival so uh, so there's many things that compound the issue or complicate the issue and, and complicate helping people that are struggling with it what are some of the things that you've seen that have helped or that have been effective um, just being open about it being able to talk with people and, and let them know that uh, you're not alone mm -hmm. uh, there's we're all <laughs> at some point uh, we're all having the same issues that you may have had uh, physically or mentally, um, and just just really being an advocate for some of the programs that are out yeah. in our community that uh, that do advocacy work and, and reach out and will physically come out to you and help you with it. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen that that's very helpful. Um, but uh, I do see that really if somebody really gets to the point where they want change, um, they have to go to, the, they, they need to be involved in some type of long-term program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, I have seen people that have done it on their own, um, but they continue to re, re, you know, relapse and, yeah. and go back at some point in time. And the, the only steady thing that I've seen is long-term mm -hmm. um, programs that um, a daily help. Yeah. So. Unfortunately, there are a lot of programs. That, you know, it's a, it, it absolutely is a long-term solution, but that's not to be seen as overwhelming or mm -hmm. uh, to you know take away somebody's hope. Because I mean, think of it: your your life experience that got you to the position that you were that's a long-term experience too mm -hmm. so if you go down you know it was a long road that you went down to get to the place that you are mm -hmm. 
it's going to be a long road to move beyond that. But such as life, I mean, life is a long road. It's a long journey. And one of the beautiful things about when you make that decision or when you realize, you know, when you want to take control of your life and enter into a recovery phase of your life, I understand recovery is just the time that you decide to take control of your life and make positive change and be more in control of your life. When you make that decision, then there's, there's nothing but hope for a better future. Once you learn the skills and once you develop some of the tools and resources or get, get access to some of the resources, uh, there's nothing but hope for a better future, and that's what you know. That's what we sh all should live towards and and, uh, and and strive for in our life is living into our potential. You know, in, enjoying the life that we have, uh, right. dealing with some of the the consequences or dealing with some of the issues that we face that everybody faces, just like you said. Uh, and that's and I also believe that having these conversations and talking more about it will help some people kind of come out from you know from the shadows or come out and and be willing to face their challenges, face their struggles when they see and recognize that other people in the community have also struggled in certain ways that you might not have known or might not have understood. Uh, it can empower people to come out and seek seek that help. Absolutely. And we got into this as a community, and the only way we're going to get out is as a community. That's right. Doing it together. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about the war on drugs and trying to, and, and many of the contributing factors to the situation that we're at and why focusing on those isn't going to be the solution. Uh, again, if there's any questions or any, any comments you want to add, you can find us on Facebook. Send me an email, garrett at garrettbiss.com. And if you have a question I can't get to it now, I'll be sure to address it in the future. And join us back here in just three minutes. And we're live, we're back, and we still have our special guest, Matt Knight, and then this other, another gentleman joined us. And sir, go ahead and uh, why don't you tell your name to everybody who might not recognize you. Steve Tyson, I All wanted right. to thank you for having me on today. It's oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a pleasure. Here with you. Yeah. Garrett, you mentioned something um, in your, your last segment about uh, the fact that we need to talk about this issue that we have in this country. I think for many years it's, it's been something that's been taboo to talk about. Families are embarrassed about it. People that have the problem, the addiction, are embarrassed, to, you know, that they have it, and and we have to talk about it because another thing you mentioned, the war on drugs, uh, Matthew, has not been a very successful war. We've been waging this war for generations, and what we've been doing uh, has not been working. And as Albert Einstein is quoted as saying uh, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Sure. So, um, anyhow, I, I, I was thinking about this a little bit yesterday and I don't know if it's my engineering background or I just love kind of visualizing things or having metaphors to better understand things, but I was thinking if this, you know, if we have a container, whether it's a bucket or a bottle of water and it's leaking, there'd be two ways that we could get the bucket to stop leaking. The first thing would be to, I think the obvious thing would be to patch it or fix the bucket, fix the container. The other way to get it to stop leaking is take all the water out of it, and then it won't leak anymore. Granted, we won't have a container to carry our water in, but I feel like the war on drugs is essentially trying to solve the solution by that removing all the water so it doesn't leak anymore. We try to, the war on drugs has been aimed at stopping the supply of drugs, getting drugs off the streets, thinking that that's going to cure the problem. But just like this, if we only take the water out, of course it won't leak anymore, it won't make a mess, but we lose the function of this container to carry water. I think instead of having a war on drugs, we need to have a war on the wanting of drugs because a very slight semantic shift in focus, but a huge change in philosophy. The war of, on wanting drugs then begs the question, well, what do people want drugs? And if we can better understand why people seek drugs or seek solutions external to their body to deal with some kind of internal pain or suffering, then we've got to look at different solutions, different ways to help people and different ways to fix the problem. But if we can help somebody move through the pain, move through the suffering, deal with the, the effects of whether it's trauma or lack of coping mechanisms or too much stress in their life or mental health issues, whatever it is that's fueling that wanting for the drugs or the behavior, then we can make a real, a real difference. If you just take the drug out of the equation, people are going to find other ways to escape, and they're, they're going to still have that will still uh, suffer the effects of the consequences of people who are not thriving, not enjoying life, not making the contribution, not living the life that they want to. Even if you, even if you solve the problem in a, you know, for a person by removing that drug from their life, but you never help them go beyond that to the underlying issues, then you have a person who is just suffering every day because they've lost their their survival mechanism. So now, instead of focusing on their family, on their community, on their job, on their contribution, they're only focusing on the fact that they're suffering every day because they don't have that escape mechanism. 
So I think that's the first place to start is instead of focusing on the drug, the drug's not the bad thing. It's the, all the consequences of drugs in our society that's the bad thing. And the drug's not the bad thing for the person. It's all the things that make them want that drug or feel that they need that drug to survive. That's where the problem is. So that's where, we, that's where I think we need to make a fundamental change of focus on why somebody wants the drugs and, pet, and wage a war on people wanting drugs. And, and one of the things that's a, uh, you know, one of the consequences of this is, well, there are many consequences, but one is that uh, through the program that I'm doing with the Craven Community College, it's called the Craven Continues, uh, and will culminate in the in March with another Stop the Craven uh, program. But one of the series in that is I'm going to the community college, and I'm going to be teaching a residential home security class, and that is a uh, result of uh, our opioid issues. Um, People, when they run out of money, they go and get other people's stuff. That's and right. so we've gotten to the point now where I have to go and teach people how to fortify and secure their homes mm -hmm. uh, in order to combat uh, our, our epidemic in right. our area. And, um, and that, that's one of the sad truths that, uh, you know, the, the tremors and the after effects of, of right. what this does. It's part of the reality, and it's unfortunate that time and energy and resources need to be spent on fixing some of the consequences of the problems and not on addressing the, the core problem. And, and as a community, I think we've gone nose blind to the fact of, of what is actually happening and that we need to join forces together. Mm -hmm. Everybody's just kind of accepted it as day, so, daily life, and, uh, you know, we've been a we, it's, it's like we've been a fish so long in the water that we don't even realize we're wet anymore. Yeah. And uh, we've got to get the awareness out there. We've got to get together as a community, and uh, we've got to get together and, and do it. And I see hope because, I mean, I, the way that I understand the things that happen in life and the world in general is there's nothing that's purely good and purely bad. And if, some, you know, this, this tragedy that we've been facing, this epidemic that we've faced, it's obviously, uh, it, it's, it's, very unfortunate, very sad that we're in this situation, but maybe this is how bad we had to get so that we can make these fundamental changes in the way that we understand humanity, the way that we understand our our culture and our community so that we can make that shift. Maybe the pendulum had to swing this far to wake us up to the point and get us ready to invest what we need to as a community to get back to a better place. Garrett, and you're, and you're studying this, this problem. Is, is it worse in the United States than it is in, in any other Western nation or any nation for that yeah, matter? Yeah, in, in many ways it is. Uh, there's some nations where they've gone drastically different routes. There's some places where they've completely legalized drugs. There's some places where they've completely decriminalized drugs, which is two different uh, philosophies or two different approaches. Uh, and there's places where they invest more time and energy in those underlying reasons. Uh, but then there's places where it's worse, certainly. Uh, but we can look to and try to learn from other other cultures, other communities, and see how they're doing things. If there's a way that we can leverage that, but ultimately, well, all we our, our I think that we should certainly. I think that uh, sometimes we feel like only solutions can happen in the United States. And, that's right. And yeah, looking and abroad for some wisdom yeah. or some influence, uh, but then we've got to bring it back and, and integrate it into our own culture. There are there are some places we're doing things differently. So. Uh, Col you know, Colorado and Washington, we mentioned this before, so Colorado has gone the legalization route. They legalize marijuana, they tax it. Um, now that's just, you know, one drug, one form of escape. But all, and then Washington has decriminalized it, meaning that, they, you know, that's, it's a lot less likely for you to get in trouble or, or severe trouble if you're caught with a small amount of, of drugs on you. But then this, again, this is now we're looking for solutions to a problem, but I think we're trying to solve the wrong problem. Let's get back to understanding why, um, why somebody has that craving, why somebody is going after that. You know, it's war, wage that war on wanting drugs because I think that's the only place that we can really shift our culture and our society to a better place. Granted, some of those consequences, some of the reason that people want and crave drugs is because of the situation that they're in, the terrible situation that they're in, and many times that's compounded by the legal issues that they face or the stigma that they face and, uh, and or the shame and the guilt that they suffer inside because of it. But to, but the, the focus needs to be on finding things that we can do to make that change. And too often, you know, you can't open the, the newspaper or turn on the news today without hearing of another reason that we're in this situation. Oh, we wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for the drug manufacturers. Oh, we wouldn't be in this situation if it wasn't for, you know, the, the, the political climate or whatever it is. Like, we keep finding new scapegoats and trying to focus all our attention on that thing, thinking that that's what created our problem in America. And it's not. They, they, 
Un and unfortunately, when we focus our attention on that, we're, de we're, we're disempowering ourselves to make a difference because we're saying, oh, it was that drug manufacturer. Oh, it was that external thing. It's the, you know, whatever it is. And that disempowers us to make the changes that we can. The reality is that if you took all those things away, we'd still have problems uh, with, you know, it, internally and problems with the way that people show up or the way that people suffer through their, the pain that they have. I would, I, I would hope that we sometime see a day where, when, with, with the millions and billions of dollars that we spend with programs <coughs> and different advocacies um, on the back end, I would hope that we would find a day where we would have uh, not too invasive, but some mental health screenings and uh, in our schools and with yeah. our young children so that they don't have to back through a door that they've already walked through as, mm -hmm. a, as a young adult. Sure. They get to that door and they have healthy, positive ways to uh, combat the feelings that they have and never walk through that door. Right. And so uh, That's why, a great why point. not get them so early so that we don't hopefully have as many cases. Um, right, and I've seen life. some people presenting that, that option in California. Somebody's running, I think, on their platform. I'm not sure yep. if she was elected or if it's part of her platform. Yep. But that's one thing that she's recommended. And that's a great way, I mean, just think of, you know, making such a big shift. Like, that's how we can reduce some of the stigma and the shame with people. You know, recognize, hey, we're all in this boat together. Right. We all have our own issues. And if we can ingrain it in children's minds that, hey, it's not a problem. Hey, we're here to help you. It's okay. Uh, and yes, maybe there are other people in your class that have also faced problems, so you shouldn't feel so isolated or alone w when you do. I think that's the kind of shift that we need to take so that we can really change this conversation and, and move forward. But this is a conversation, again, we, we, we've all said that, you know, that we need to have more conversations about this. When people need to be, uh, feel comfortable to tell their stories more so we can talk about the effects that it's had in our community and make people feel less afraid and less full of shame to come forward and, and seek help or seek those resources. Just by having a better understanding of it, a lot of less people will suffer the, these consequences. A lot of less people will feel isolation and disconnection, which is one of the fundamental reasons that people turn to a, a means to escape or avoid or numb. These are conversations I want to continue to have. If there's anything that I can do to serve you, if you have any questions, any things that you want to be, that, uh, that you'd like to have discussed, again, you can email me, Garrett, at GarrettBiss.com. I'm happy to come back on here at any time, and I'm happy to have Steve on my show any Monday morning. Uh, well, I but, hope you come back on a regular basis, yeah, because I'd love to get out uh, I, I think this is the most important issue that the country's facing right now. I mean, we can't afford to lose 50,000 mostly young mm -hmm. Uh, men and women right. uh, t every year to uh, opiate overdoses. Right. And those are the severe cases. I mean, those are the people that we lose, but how many hundreds of thousands of people oh, are affects, disengaged from work? Million, they're not, yeah, yeah, they're not of engaging in their families million, and, their, so. and their children. It's only something that's going to continue to get worse. We'll be back in a few minutes to continue this conversation. All right, we're back. So what we've been discussing is addiction and some of the things in America that haven't been working and some of the ways that we might be able to make a shift so that people can get some help that, that they need and we can move beyond this epidemic that we've been facing for many, many years in America. And we've talked a little bit about how that shift needs or could take place and some of the things that we can do, one of the most important things that we can do is just continue to have conversations about what addiction is, how it affects people's lives, how it shows up for some different people, what are some of the contributing factors that might make somebody more susceptible or have a greater propensity towards addictive substances or behaviors. Maybe we can recognize that before they go down that road or if somebody who's heading down that road, how do we have conversations or make them feel safe to have conversations to get the resources that they need, the resources that are already available in our community so that they can prevent themselves from some of the more drastic consequences, the severe consequences moving down that way. One of the most, uh, uh, again, a, a very important thing to do is just have a greater understanding of what addiction is and how it manifests. It's not, there's not one reason that somebody becomes addicted to a substance or behavior in their life. Uh, a lot of the solutions that we see around us or a lot of the services that we see around us focus on one cause for an addiction, but there's many different reasons. There's, depending on the individual, there's biological reasons, there's sociological reasons, there's psychological reasons, some people there's spiritual reasons. And just like every, just like the primary colors, we have three primary colors of which every color in the world is composed of, every individual who struggles with substance use disorder or addiction, they have some combination of biological, sociological, psychological, or spiritual influences on their situation that have got them to the place that they are. One thing that can compound that one topic that's almost inex inextricably connected with addiction or with substance use disorder is trauma. 
So trauma is something that many people face. The definition of trauma, you know, sometimes sometimes we think we know what trauma is or what it is not. The definition of trauma, you know, the very simple concept or understanding uh, of what trauma is, as I as I understand it, is it's an event or a circumstance that somebody faces that completely shifts their values, their beliefs, or their understanding of the world. So if somebody goes through a traumatic experience, they had a way that they understood the world before that experience, and that's made a shift to the way that they understand and see the world after that experience. Another kind of trauma that people suffer is developmental trauma. So just not having those resources that they need during the developmental stage of their life to develop the coping mechanisms that they need to deal with the, st the stresses and challenges that they'll experience later in life. That can be traumatic. So trauma is something that affects many people in many different ways, uh, but it's also something that's very personal. One reason that it's hard to identify things that are traumatic is because it depends on the individual as much as it depends on the event or circumstance that they face. Your neighbor might have experienced something and it wasn't traumatic for them. You go through a similar situation and it is traumatic to you because of who you are or what, what the other things that you're facing in your life. Or you personally might have experienced the same or similar things multiple times in your life. Sometimes it wasn't traumatic and then ultimately one time it does become traumatic and that affects you. So understanding trauma and the effects of it is a very important thing because of its relationship to putting somebody in a situation where they need that external mechanism, that external substance or behavior to avoid or escape or numb. And one of the things I want to do with this conversation is help people understand some of the resources that are in the community if these are some of the situations that they face. We have one uh, in incredible organization and a wonderful guest that will help us understand a little bit more about this organization and how people can reach out and get some of the services that they, that they pr uh, provide here at Promise Place. So if you could tell us what exactly is Promise Place. That's right. So Promise Place is a sexual assault resource center. We're a 501c3. We've been in business for almost 42 years. Um, most people think, although we're experts in sexual assault, we also provide trauma-informed therapy and advocacy services to anybody that's been a victim of a crime or endured trauma. Um, I, I could go on about the sure. numerous things that we do. And, um, and, so, and I'm sorry, let's step back for a second and if you could introduce yourself and tell us exactly what you do at the organization Promise Place. Absolutely. So my name's Candace and I'm a community educator and I'm also the volunteer coordinator for our agency. Wonderful. And so what specifically kind of, uh, what specific services could somebody expect to get or receive from Promise Place? Right. Um, so when you come to Promise Place, the services that you're going to receive are trauma advocacy services and trauma-informed therapy services. Um, advocacy could be something as simple as coming up with a safety plan or connecting you to employability services or housing resources in the area. And some of our trauma-informed therapy services um, could be EMDR, it could be SITCAP, it could be play therapy. Um, we serve ages three and up, and we've heard all sorts of trauma stories that have come through our doors. Um, one of the things that I can say that uh, you touch base on and I want to echo it is that trauma is subjective. It varies from individual. It could be something as simple as obviously being sexually assaulted or it could be witnessing an overdose. It could be chronic unemployment. It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be divorce. It could be food insecurity. It is subjective and um, it varies from individual to individual. Um, we have a multitude of therapeutic services that are tailored specifically for that individual because our number one priority is making sure that we address that trauma so we can get to the root of it and a person become, they can become happy and healthy again. Yeah. And, what, and what I understand of trauma is such a complex thing because not only maybe that event was traumatic and, and for an event it might, you know, we always think of like violence like being the victim of violence or being a victim of some horrific accident or something like that but, it, but just a simple change in your life can be traumatic. When your definition of who you are, your understanding of who you are and how you relate with the world and, and what you bring to the world, when that changes, whether it's through a retirement and now your whole life looks something different or through, um, you know, a change in your family situation, you know, it's traumatic for many uh, parents when their children go off because they had a, an understanding of who they were and what they represented in the world now it looks different so now just kind of going through that but it's not that situation that is always affected but it's everything else that is affected that then compounds the negative effects of the trauma so maybe your traumatic experience was 
uh, you know, you were the victim of a crime, but now that has affected your ability to work or to engage, or uh, affected your ability to have social interactions with other people, which then that compounds every situation that you face. So if I understand correctly, not only do you help people with that specific thing that was traumatic or those specific things that were traumatic, but then all the negative effects of that trauma and how they've manifest in their life so that you can get them back to a healthier, wholer place so that they can deal with that trauma and move forward. Candace, can I ask you a couple of questions? Absolutely. One, what age uh, ranges do you serve? We serve ages three and up. And I've got to tell you that we do have those children coming through our doors. Um, it could be. And, and let me let me follow up real quick. You can answer them both. Uh, do you have to be referred to your organization we by DSS or, or anybody, or you just no? Show so up? as long as as long if something has happened to you and you need those mental health services, you need those coping mechanisms. If you need um, clues on prevention, you just come to us. You don't need a referral. Um, although we do those interagency referrals quite often, we work with social services all the time, for example. Um, if you need help, our number one goal when you come through those doors is for you to get help. Um, keep in mind, too, that there can also be secondary victims involved. So if a son or daughter has been sexually assaulted or if um, they do have an addiction, there are people around them that love them that can be affected by somebody else's trauma and then in turn that trauma then transfers over to that person. So if you're going through a hard time, you can come to our doors for some really marginalized therapeutic practices, but also for some advocacy services. Um, a lot of people wonder what advocacy services are. That can, like I mentioned earlier, it could be something along the lines of a safety plan, helping you navigate through the court system, um, notifying you of what your rights are. Um, it could be those employability services. It could be what are the local resources available to me. Chronic unemployment can be traumatic for somebody. Somebody who worked their whole life thinking that they're going to be retiring at a certain age and then their retirement is gone and they have to go back into the work field can be traumatic for somebody. So those advocacy services can help get you back into school or you know, find a new it, it career. It really sounds like a, a you offer a lot of different yeah. resources. And how does somebody find out or get connected with? Yeah, so it's it's super easy. Um, we have offices in New Bern, Craven Terrace at Craven Community College and Pamlico, Pamlico Community College in Jones County. Um, you can go online to www.promiseplacenewburnnc.org or you can give our main office a call as well. And what's that main office number? 252-636-3381. And is that also the crisis line or is there another number for the crisis line? We do have a crisis line phone number. Um, <clears throat> that I want to mention that that crisis line, it is not handled by third parties. It's handled by our staff um, and it runs 24-7 please go online to find out more information for that crisis line and some of our services. We really recommend you to do that. Fantastic. We'll keep you on for the next segment because you do some other things with Promise Place that people might not have thought to uh, associate with the work that you do, but you think you kind of touched on it. Yeah. Really quickly, though, a couple barriers that might prevent people from coming and seeking services there. A lot of people might fear how much it costs. So what's it cost to get services at Promise Place? We are completely comprehensive. There is no charge for our services. Okay. Fantastic. And another thing, people might be afraid because of the shame and because of the stigma of coming out and seeking help. So do they have to worry about, is there any confidentiality with seeking services? 100% confidential. Even if you choose not to report something, it stays within our walls. 100% confidential and a safe space for somebody. So if somebody was a victim of a crime, they wouldn't have to report that crime to the police to get services from you? No. Okay. Not if they're not ready. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, and we'll keep you on for a couple more minutes because there's some other great things that uh, you have to share. We'll be right back. All right, we are back for our final segment. Unfortunately, we have so much to talk about and just not enough to cram into one hour. So if you've joined us this morning, I hope you'll be looking for us again in the future as we continue this conversation. This morning, we've been talking all about addiction, about how it shows up, how it manifests in our community and in our society and things that haven't worked and maybe some things that will work to help us make some fundamental shifts in the future so that we can navigate our way out of this epidemic that we face. One of the most important things that we can do is have conversations about it, help people uh, move beyond some of the misunderstandings or misconceptions about addiction and about substance use disorder and behavioral addictions, and help people 
uh, come out from behind the the shame or the confusion or the guilt that they are facing when they're in situations that they really need some help. One of the things that I want to do to help this, to help affect this, is continue having conversations like this, not just here, but also throughout the community. If there's something that you would like to talk about, if there's some way that I can serve you or an organization that you're a part of, please don't hesitate. Reach out to me. You can send me an email at garrett at garrettbiss.com. And I'm also happy to send you some information about some of the other resources, other work that I do, helping people who struggle with addiction, behavioral or substance related, and people who are trying to really live into their potential and experience the kind of recovery that they want. We also talked a little bit about trauma and how it affects or how it's almost inextricably connected to substance use disorder and addiction. One of the things that we need to do moving forward in our society is help people identify issues and get connected with resources before they get to that rock bottom place before they get to that place where they're experiencing consequences that are only compounding their situation. There's a lot of wonderful resources even in our uh, community right here. We have Ms. Candace on talking about one wonderful organization, Promise Place, and all the things that they do. She talked about some of the services that they provide, how you can get connected. Again, if you would, what's the website and what's the phone number where people can get connected and get sure. some help? It's www.promiseplacenewburn.org, and you can give us a call at 252-636-3381. If you have any questions or if you just need to chat, please reach out because prevention is key, and talking about it is the only way to address what's really happening. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that, and thank you very much for being on here this morning. So. We talked about what trauma is and how some of the services that you provide, but also how a traumatic event or experience can compound many other situations in your life, which then makes it much harder to get out of that hole that you're in and move forward to living into your potential or, or really uh, you know, living life back as the way that you want to. So what are some of the other consequences that people face or the ways that it shows up in their life after they've gone through a traumatic chapter or traumatic experience? And what are some of the other services that Promise Place provides? To help that. So we know that when trauma occurs, disassociation can happen, anxiety can happen, there's a multitude of things that can happen. Um, one of the other resources that Promise Place took it upon itself, because we noticed that this was going on around us and nobody wants to talk about it, was food insecurity. Okay, That can be traumatic, especially for children. So in January of this year, in Craven Terrace, um, next to our office, we opened up a food pantry. Um, the food pantry, you, again, you can go to www.promiseplacenewburnnc to find out more information or give us a call, but um, it runs 24-7 and it's there to serve our individuals. Um, to date, a very small portion of this food pantry has gifted out over 133,000 pounds of food to Craven, Craven community. Wow. So again, that's one small portion mm -hmm. of it. Um, some of the other things that we do, we have some teen preventative groups going on. So if you're looking to um, kind of, you know, tackle some of those issues, you can reach out to us for that. We also have some up and coming groups going on for anybody that's seeking some outside resources. Um, please give us a call for that information because those, some of those are tentative right now. Um, there's lots of stuff happening around us and we make it a point to try to address as much as we possibly can because, for example, the, the food insecurity. How can mom so, or dad so what get do you, better? How do you define food insecurity for somebody not familiar with that term? Okay, so how, if, if you can't buy hamburger meat for yourself mm -hmm. or for your son or daughter, how can you focus on getting better? If you, if you have an empty fridge and your child is, is going to school. Calling. How do you want me to take this? Just hit line one? Just hit the line, yeah. Hey, this is Garrett. You're on All About Craven. Hello. Hello. This is Garrett. You're Hi, on All Mr. About Craven. I'm calling for the North Carolina Fraternal Order of Police. I'm speaking to the owner, please. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to up. hit the speaker. <laughs> All right. So All we thought we had a caller in with a great question for Promise Place, <laughs> so we wanted to entertain that. But okay, now after our comic relief. So back to food insecurity. So just understanding that, obviously, if you're most basic human needs aren't taken care of, then your ability to seek help for yourself or for your family is compromised because all your focus, all your attention is on how am I going to feed myself and my children? You're following, you're tracking what I'm trying to okay. lay down. All and right. you, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Mom and dad are having anxiety about making sure that they have something in their stomach, how they're going to keep the lights on. 
Um, are they going to make enough money at work? How can I find a job? These are all real things that happen to somebody. And how can you come through our door and try to get uh, mental trauma, mental health services when, when you're worried about so much stuff going on behind the scenes? Sure. It's just not the reality. It's not going to happen for you to get better if that's what's going on. And when there's so much anxiety in your life and, and around you, you're in a constant state of stress, that fight or flight state, that's not where you can be focused on working through or finding those resources, right. connecting with those resources. So even if you try to provide those resources to somebody, if they're still in that, that traumatic state, how are you going to help them? It's, it's not going to get out? better. Yeah. It's not going to get better. You know, you and I had a conversation yesterday, too, that kind of addressed um, drug use mm -hmm. and trauma. We know that other than a social connection, um, people often turn to drugs because something traumatic has happened. We've also heard stories about people spending, you know, their last $10 on drugs versus feeding their family. Sure. These are real things that happen. And that's how trauma connects with, because as I mentioned, so everybody, every individual that's experiencing some substance or behavioral addiction, they have some different combination of biological, sociological, psychological, and spiritual factors that are contributing to that, putting them in that situation. Trauma can dislodge or affect every area there. You know, a traumatic event can affect you spiritually, biologically, sociologically, psychologically. Uh, so, but navigating out of that, it's going to look a little bit different for every person, right? Because it's that personal experience. Navigating out of it can be one of the hardest things an individual can ever do. Anybody that's been in a traumatic situation, there's more often not a stigma associated, let's say, with domestic violence or drug use or whatever trauma occurred. Yeah. But those people are often the underdogs when they do come out of something like that. And instead of looking at them and associating them with whatever it is you're thinking in your head, why don't we just try to talk about it and address yeah. it? Because prevention is key, and right. there are places to get help. And let's help prevent people from getting that situation. I, I would ask you if you even think, if you're not feeling right, if something's going on in your life and things are just different now than what they used to be, reach out to Promise Place, see if you can get some support. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching CTV 10's All About Craven. For more information or to schedule a guest for the show, check us out on the web at www.allaboutcraven.com or call Otis Tut at CTV 10 at 633-2544.